thing. I'm going to invite my panelists to the stage. We've got uh, Senator Paul Pinsky. We've got Secretary of Maryland Department of Environment, Ben Grumbles. We have the Executive Director of the Chesapeake Bay Commission, Ann Swanson. And finally, getting mic'd up, in the, uh, and we have Stuart Clark, the Executive Director of Town Creek. Ben's still getting mic'd up in the back. Um, what we um, uh, have titled this summit is Environmental Intelligence for the 21st Century. But we haven't really talked much about what environmental intelligence is. So to introduce this session, I thought I'd do a little bit of that introduction of what environmental intelligence is. Bill Cooper just finished talking about the data revolution. Joseph Lee earlier today talked about the drones and the satellites and the autonomous vehicles that are creating the big data streams that we can use, environmental data that's, that's, that's flooding in. And it's all, but the danger there of the big data streams, it's like trying to get a drink out of a fire hose. You can increase the pressure of that hose, but that doesn't make it any easier to get a drink. So we've also increased our information generation capacity, particularly for data analysis like statistics and GIS and uh, modeling uh, that you've seen examples of uh, this morning. And then we turning that information into knowledge and building knowledge is something that we're, we're working very hard on. At UMSEs, we've we partnered with College Park for the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center here or down the street in Annapolis. We've got uh, science visualization techniques that we're pioneering. We do environmental report cards, for example, that synthesize a lot of data. But it's all about taking that data into information, into knowledge, to build environmental intelligence. And so, fortunately, we have a very intelligent panel here because what I call environmental intelligence is taking good and trusted science, communicating it effectively in a timely manner to make a difference. And these represent, these people represent examples of partners that we work with. None of these people are UMSI's people because they're partners that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis to, to try to build that environmental intelligence. So by way of introduction, I'm going to ask each of them to answer a question. I'm going to start with Senator Paul Pinsky. Uh, to, uh, and Paul is a member of the Maryland Senate since 1994. He's an outspoken advocate for environment and natural resources. He's been the vice chair of the Environment Education and an Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee since 2015, and it just was announced that he is going to take over the chairmanship of that in the next session in uh, January 2019. So, Paul, can you tell us an example of how we can use UMC science to help advance your environmental agenda? Great. Oh, okay. First, let me say uh, my name is Paul, and I'm not a scientist. So, total disclaimer. Um, uh, thanks for being here. And, and, you know, Bill suggested we start with an example, and I just want to give a couple of examples. I don't want to be limited by one. And I'm going to throw out a few pieces of legislation we've worked on in the last 9 to 11 or 12 years. Uh, in 2007, for the first time, we introduced the uh, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act in Maryland. At that point, we were calling for a 25% reduction by 2020. Now, Hindsight's 2020. Um, it should have been a hell of a lot larger. Uh, since then, we now have a, a bill on the books, um, a 40% reduction by 2030. And I w let me mention a third bill. Last year, we passed legislation, which I sponsored with some other colleagues, uh, dealing with mitigation and adaptation, uh, nuisance flooding, uh, salt intrusion on the eastern shore in agriculture, um, ensuring that. Um, projects, public projects that are cited, particularly in low, low areas, uh, are built with the understanding of not just sea level rise, but category two storms. We saw what happened in Houston, and we're trying to up the ante uh, to make sure we don't invest public dollars in roads or schools, which won't be, um, won't, won't be usable for 20 or 40 or 80 days a year, uh, 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. So we passed a number of bills. and, and and one of the key groups, organizations, institutes, is UMSIs that I went, would go to first. One for information to help guide me in, in developing the bill, in structuring the bill, because they understand the science. And, and two, 
to verbalize, taking from the science to the lay language for my colleagues who are not knowledgeable and in some cases oppositional, uh, to make the case. And for the years that I've worked with UMSIs, and this is not just a stroke UMSIs uh, presentation, um, they have been the center of, of science for the state of Maryland in my mind. And whether it's Peter now or Don before him, uh, they were the state scientists who dealt with data, who either took international or national data and translated that to what it, the import for Maryland, whether it be sea level rise or more severe storms, whatever it might be. And they were the ones who had the uh, gravitas, the institutional knowledge, the scientific uh, data, and also the ability tr to translate that for the public good and consumption. So, so they are the reasons I keep going to UMSIs when I've developed or created or have a gem of an idea, or in my mind a gem, <laughs> uh, later to be shot down by somebody, um, to address issues, whether it be climate change or oysters. You know, um, they have the knowledge. They do the scientific work uh, at the center. So, you know, people come in with... Uh, half-baked knowledge, and I put that in quotes, and assertions, and clearly the people from those industries who are looking much more short-term than long-term uh, come up with their on-the-fly science, purely anecdotal, obviously, uh, and it's crucial. And each time I've had to go back to, to the uh, center, or we've had a battle, and they come up every year in Annapolis because there really are lots of different interests, some take the short, short view of tomorrow, others take the long view of a year, five years, 10 years, 50 years. But that continues to be a battle. And when I go and, and develop legislation or sit at the witness table, uh, I want people with me who know what they're talking about, can pull not just the facts from Maryland or California or New Orleans, but internationally and can make that interrelationship um, more real to people. And again, sometimes it doesn't matter uh, while the Maryland legislature isn't quite like Congress or the White House, um, in some ways it's a microcosm. We have our own deniers, our own people who close their eyes or say, yeah, one of these things is a problem, but we shouldn't go down that route for whatever reason. So, um, but they're always a, what I call the middle forces. I mean, there are some people who get it and have gotten it for years. There are some people who will never get it. But there's what I call the broad middle. They're the ones we have to influence. And whether it's in the state senate or the state house, you need a majority. And if you're pushing the envelope, you've got to convince that broad middle. And by and large, they're decent people. Maybe some are misguided or have the wrong facts, and that's why we have to move, and that's why I go to UMSI's uh, very quickly and very early. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Great. Next, uh, Secretary Ben Grumbles. Uh, he's been the Secretary of Department of Environment since 2015. Before that, he was uh, based in D.C. as the president of the U.S. Water Alliance. He's uh, been... Uh, he's went out to Arizona for a bit. He's been the assistant uh, administrator for, for water, for EPA, uh, uh, and, and comes from George Washington University where Senator Pinsky also uh, went, uh, Wake Forest and Emory. Ben. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here, and it's great to be on a, a panel to talk about one of the most important topics of the day, and uh, that is uh, in the world of making good decisions, it's a combination of law, policy, and facts. And uh, from the very beginning, and getting to serve on the Hogan administration, I saw that the key to making good policy is ha having an uh, understanding and appreciation of the facts, and science has a tremendously important role in not only identifying the facts, but helping to shape the policymakers. And I continue to believe that one of the great attributes of Maryland is it's the only state in the nation I know of 
that has uh, the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science on board as one of its advisors and members of the governor's Chesapeake Bay cabinet. Uh, so it's really an opportunity to shed light <coughs> and facts to make better policy decisions and identify where the law uh, should be changed. One of my favorite sayings that many of you heard is that uh, the tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by ugly facts. <laughs> and I would say that the tragedy of today's politics is the slaying of beautiful science by ugly dogma. Mm. And so as we uh, at this summit gather uh, really uh, thoughtful, informed scientists and students and leaders for tomorrow, uh, I would say the key for us in making good policy decisions is to have science-based informed facts and understand the trade-offs and make smart decisions. One of the best examples, Bill, to, to answer your question of, of, uh, of uh, the use, the role of UMSI's science to help advance an environmental agenda is in a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and that is the Conowingo Water Quality Certification. This is a provision under the Clean Water Act, Section 401 of the Federal Clean Water Act, that gives a governor a veto over any uh, federal license or permit, federally issued license or permit, uh, if uh, the state concludes that that activity would not uh, comply with state water quality standards. And so, um, for us, we have used the uh, role and the scientific expertise from UMSEs to help determine flow, the proper flow of the river, um, because it's such a huge, huge contributor to the health, not only of the lower Susquehanna River, but of the entire Chesapeake Bay. And so we sought expertise from UMSEs. Uh, in March of 2018, there was a workshop set up to provide scientific in input. Uh, UMSI's demonstrated a certain degree of nimbleness, which is remarkably needed and, and difficult within the scientific community to support, uh, provide the state policymakers information to actually help us include the legally enforceable conditions relating to flow that would go into the 401 water quality certification that would be a federally enforceable component of a 50-year relicensing of the Conowingo Dam. So that's a really important example of, of relying on UMSEs to provide information. Now, we worked with uh, the Nature Conservancy, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and others, but it's a science-based approach to including legally enforceable flow standards for the flow regime of the Susquehanna River, the Conowingo Dam. Good one. Thank you, Ben. Great. Next, uh, I'm introducing Stuart Clark. Stuart is the executive director of the Town Creek Foundation since 2004. He and I are neighbors in Easton, Maryland. And uh, I think the best description and summary of, of Stuart when I went to a, a, a workshop that was a bunch of river keepers, and they, they said, Stuart is Yoda. <laughs> so, Yoda. <laughs> sort of makes me afraid to say anything. I don't know where to go from there. So, so thank you, Bill, and um, thank you, Peter, and congratulations, Peter. This is a wonderful event. Um, I want to say just a little bit about the Town Creek Foundation because that will help to inform um, how I describe the, the way that we've worked with UMSEs. We are a uh, privately endowed grant-making foundation, and we support environmental advocacy work throughout the state of Maryland. So the constituency that we serve are civil society organizations that largely see themselves to, try, to be trying to help close the gap between what science says is necessary for environmental progress and what politics say is possible. So our, our constituency is trying to close that gap by bringing the politics closer to the science. So our, these folks see UMSEs as a latent ally in that work. Uh, they recognize that, uh, that, science, that the way in which most scientists understand the norms of their work 
makes them a little uncomfortable getting too close to the advocacy space. Um, but notwithstanding that, our constituency sees UMSIs as, as an ally. And the role that we have tried to play at the Town Creek Foundation is to identify opportunities where we could support and encourage UMSIs to, to um, engage in the advocacy value chain in, a way, in ways that enabled UMSIs to feel as if they were keeping their hands clean. <laughs> and we, over the course of the past 10 years, we have made about a million dollars in grants to UMSIs um, in, to, to, to engage in that kind of work. And, and, and what does that look like? Um, it has included uh, deploying the communications capacity of Bill's shop to help um, develop, design, and deploy uh, materials to help communicate climate change risks and climate change opportunities across the state. It's also involved um, UMSIs deploying their capacity in support of state agency work. Uh, a good deal of that involved the development of the, first, of the state's first greenhouse gas reduction plan. It's also involved UMSIs deploying their reputation for objectivity as a facilitator to help other organizations, often civil society organizations and state agencies, to, 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 to better work together and develop collaborative um, approaches and, and collaborative decision making. So, so we've tried to be that entity that could help ensure that the great potential that UMSEAS has to be supportive of the work of folks that are trying to move policy change in the state that that could be deployed in a way that was comfortable for UMCs and also comfortable for the folks doing that work. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, uh, Ann Swanson, uh, the executive director of the Chesapeake Bay Commission for about, what, 30 years, uh, is, leads this tri-state legislative committee that advises the General Assemblies of Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. I learned last night at dinner that Anne met her husband, Eric, at the University of Vermont. Uh, that's significant because they produced a son who works for the Integration Application Network. My bill shop, as Stuart indicated, Skyler. So uh, good on you for that. And, uh, Looks like you. And uh, Anne. Well, thank you very much. It's very unusual for me to have my family members here as I'm discussing this. But, um, <laughs> kind of intimidating. Uh, yeah, it is a little intimidating. Not as intimidating as you, though. No. <laughs> okay, so what I'd like to do in answering this question is, um, Bill, uh, we got on the phone in advance, Dave Namazi and Bill, and we were brainstorming what would be a good way to answer this question. And to tell you the truth, it's a difficult question to answer in that there are so many examples. And I know that Senator Pinsky, for example, he could talk about so many issues, whether it's program open space or whether it's forest conservation, whether it's the flush fee or the, the various um, uh, stormwater programs. They've all been informed by UMSI's policy, and we have countless stories to tell. But in this brief time, what I was encouraged to do is to tell you a story that actually will really demonstrate for you that in fact, science can profoundly influence policy. And so when uh, Stewart says that essentially, you know, we bring together science saying what is necessary and politics saying what is possible, well, sometimes that's a chasm and sometimes actually it's very closely aligned. And so the case of the blue crab is one where the science and the tenacity of the scientists in communicating in a thousand different ways what was necessary tells the story of where policy really can come very close together to the sciences. So I want to take you back in time to the mid-1990s. And in the mid-1990s, basically, the numbers of blue crabs were pointing towards smaller crabs. 
Um, we were seeing spawning females decline. We were seeing a shrinking crab population. And at that time, a stock assessment was issued. This was back in the days when NOAA uh, routinely funded those stock assessments. And the blue crab stock assessment came out, and in fact, it was extremely confusing. There were scientists using these terms, F and things like that, which not everyone knew what those words are. And let me say, I'm trained as a scientist, and, but not that science. And so the question was then, what are they saying? Well, the commission asked, put the scientists in the room, find out what they're telling us, what is in fact the status of the stocks? And I remember that our Maryland director was sitting next to me, and when they were all said and done giving their presentation, he leaned over to me and he said to me, Anne, who's telling the truth? You know, because you couldn't tell. The scientists were not actually, you know, communicating in terms that you could understand. Well, fast forward, the Chesapeake Bay Commission, which is a tri-state legislative commission, asked us to pull the scientists together, but also the stakeholders. And we knew that in addition to the stakeholders, I'm talking about watermen, I'm talking about processors, I'm talking about recreational crabbers, fishermen, I'm talking about academics, I'm talking about politicians, and we pulled them all together to try to figure out what was going on. Well, eventually we realized that above and beyond this committee that we were going to create across two state lines, we needed the scientists. So we developed 29 scientists by the end, blue crab scientists from across the watershed, to tell us what was in fact going on with the blue crab. And finally, for about three years, we worked. Now, during this period of time, we also reached to Sea Grant. We reached to Sea Grant and we said, we need facilitation assistance. We also reached for the Virginia Center for Environmental Negotiation. It was the Sea Grant folks that proved extraordinary communication talent. So now we had a facilitator, but we had 29 feuding scientists. And the scientists realized that they, in fact, needed consensus. And so then, the next thing that we did was we organized a charrette. And Tom Miller of UMSEs, who you've seen up here before, he had the courage to come forward and be a very balanced, dispassionate thinker. And what I didn't realize was the passion among scientists when they know that they think they're right or they have a certain factor that they feel is really important. Well, there were 29 who all had a different opinion. And eventually what we decided to do was to put them together in a charrette. Now, this made me particularly nervous because I couldn't even be in the meeting because this was, in fact, the scientists. And the scientists were in that room, and for two and a half days, they negotiated what should happen. And ultimately, they agreed that they needed a threshold and a target for managing that blue crab, and they then had to convince everyone in the Bi-State Blue Crab Committee that, in fact, we needed that and that that science would guide us in management. Now, I don't have the time to tell you the complete story here, but what I will tell you is as a result of that decision and the backbone that science gave the managers, the managers ultimately made that decision across state lines. They anchored the stock assessment work in fisheries management. They anchored biological indices in management. And ultimately, they gave the entire Bay watershed, not just Maryland, Virginia and the Potomac, the structure to make decisions for the management of the blue crab. That continues to this day, and those relationships are profound, and the fisheries managers in the room will not deny that. And the foundation of it came from UMSI's leadership and from that, it, that integrated scientific effort. UMSEs really showed the folks in the region how to manage fisheries based on science. Thanks, Ann. Great. So um, I think uh, you know, we, we have a little tagline that we use. I think I've 
developed a new one based on these panelists' discussion. The, the one we normally use was UMSI's works to harness the power of science to transform the way society understands and manages the natural environment. What I heard here was that we should call it UMSI's as, as nimble, tenacious, latent ally to fight ugly dogma. I think that'll, <laughs> that'll cover the... the, the. So, um, I think what we're going to do, I, I have another question I wanted to pose, but I think rather than do that right away, I want to open it up to the audience to get some, uh, uh, some input. Thank you for the uh, Mentimeter. I, I see communicate and listen, so we're going to listen for a minute here and see what you guys can offer on how we can do this better. We, we've heard we can do it pretty well, but we need to obviously do it better. We haven't solved the environmental problems that we're seeing today. Joseph. Uh, testing, yes. Uh, uh, thanks very much for the exciting uh, kind of uh, illustration of how good Maryland is. So my question is very general. I think uh, it seems Mar to me Maryland is very unique. You have AMSIs. But most countries in Asia or other countries uh, do not have that. I mean, even... Uh, and so my question is, usually there's a big gap between decision, decision makers, politicians, and scientists. A really big gap. Uh, you know, the CP knows the two cultures. Uh, we're not much better since 1960. So how do you start, I mean, by closing, because most, let's say in, in the part of the world I'm from, a lot of, a lot of the uh, politicians are English majors, graduates, lawyers, economists. Same in the U.S. Uh, who, who do not, who have a deep mistrust of science. And, and you know, I, I don't mean in a negative way, but, you know, it's just very difficult. So, where do you start? I mean, it's a very general question. I mean, suppose we do not have AMSIs. Uh, suppose we, you know, we have a, uh, uh, historically do not have that culture of believing in science and technology, and, and you know, there are many countries like this. Uh, where, what do you recommend we do as a start? Uh, just a very general question. Good question, Joseph. So how do we do this? Senator Pinsky, you gotta, you're the elected official here. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think most people respect science in this country. I, I think, obviously, we, on the national level, we have some people who, don't, who disrespect science, but, but I think that's an outlier. I, I think most people do respect science because it comes up in their everyday life. And I think as an elected official, I would appeal to that, whether they're a doctor, a nurse, uh, a farmer. Science affects it. Every, you know, the best practices are based on successful science and data. So it's becoming more suspect in the last two years or maybe longer, and there is an element that is sort of... Uh, uh, negating science. Um, as has been addressed, even with the understanding of science, can we do anything about it? You know, the reaction, is it something we can achieve? Is it doable? Is it practicable? What's it going to cost me to solve the problem? I, I think the gap is, is in getting people to understand their solutions that are achievable. You know, if we have to spend more time defending the science, we're in deep trouble. And, and again, on the national level, we are with the current administration. But by and large, I think that the blockage is, well, that's going to cost me money. And, and getting people to understand short-term investment versus long-term investment. And, and farmers are, are a good example. The environmental community and the farm community have been at odds for numbers of years on lots of issues. Um, but now climate change, they're starting to realize, as saltwater intrusion I mentioned, could affect their crops and food for people to eat and their income. And, and I think we have to sort of bridge the gap that an issue like climate change or like uh, um, the loss of oysters in, in the bay or other, other fisheries uh, that are in, being challenged um, has implications, economic implications and that it's in people's best interest. Making those arguments can't be done in 25 seconds or 25 words. So I, I still think it's in on, on showing common interest and working off of people's interests um, and maybe having them be engaged in the solutions rather than offering the solution, but finding a, 
uh, interest-based problem solving, if you will. Um, so. Thanks. I, I can add there. Um, so part of uh, the work that I do is staffing House and Senate members, uh, elected officials, um, and um, really doing, sort of walking that interface between science and policymakers, elected officials. One thing that the elected officials always appreciate is if you essentially tell them what they need to know. You don't tell them everything you know, because that's your job, that's your life. But when you're interfacing, for example, with Senator Pinsky's life, you need to just tell him what piece of the science that you know is relevant to the work that he's doing, the kind of work that he wants to do. I remember one time Walter Boynton, who many of you know and have worked with over the years, he was before the commission. It was like a little light bulb went off and all of a sudden he said, you know, you need to be concerned about nitrogen. And you know why you need to be concerned about nitrogen? Because nitrogen is a perfect political pollutant. That's what he said. Now, I'm sure that would have horrified you in your own labs if he had said that. But in that context, he was describing that if you ratchet down the nitrogen, you'll get an immediate response. So it's a good political pollutant because you're not dealing with, you know, years of delay in reaction. And so that was very motivating to the members in terms of their understanding of pushing for one pollutant versus another. Now, later on, of course, stories change, and then, you know, you're learning about phosphorus, say, in the soils. But the thing that's important that the scientists do is they tell the elected officials that relevant piece of information for them. And that's a really important talent that every scientist should learn and I think it will really help the elected officials. Is a political runoff more nitrogen or phosphorus? <laughs> Good. I, I, another Walter Boynton story, one I hadn't heard before. There, there, there are lots of them. He often said, just, it just boils down to too much crap and too much dirt. You know, he just cuts to the chase. He was really, really good at that. Eric. Thanks. I'm looking at this from the scientist side and, and following on from what Ann said. Um, we, the scientists, I think UMSIS does a pretty good job of this, uh, thanks to outfits like Bill's and, and our whole institution. Scientists are exposed during their training to that kind of communication that you just described and talking to stakeholders. I think that that comes from those relationships. That UMSIS has a unique relationship with the legislature and with the state managers. Um, Dr. Lee's question was about other places. It isn't going to happen overnight. I think it has to happen by the way that you reward your faculty and your students. And so when your students and your faculty are not only allowed to form those relationships and, and maybe their publication and grants and other things have to go down a little bit, but they're actually expected to. And in their annual review, in their five-year review, it says, what did you do? What stakeholders did you, you know, what committee did you, you know, did you go to the Environmental Matters Committee and, and talk? Or what stakeholder did you interface with? What white paper did you produce? Um, then, then I think it starts to really grow from the scientist side. And that's the kind of thing I think that could grow through the academy, that uh, a good idea in one place will be copied by other people in other places. But it comes down to rewards. And I think that's a theme that comes to the other discussions we had before lunch. And that is that you need to we have wonderful ideas, but you get what you measure, and so you need to start measuring what you want. Anybody respond to that? You, I, so. you could. I mean, we do have, I, I don't know if the panel knows, but we evaluate uh, for tenure and promotion based on discovery, integration, application, and teaching. So it isn't the traditional teaching, service, and research. We're actually looking for the scholarship of integration, the scholarship of application. So we, 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 we take it seriously. But I think Eric brings up the point we need to infuse that into the students as well. Uh, they, they've got to be part of that. Um, so uh, I do want to uh, give you guys a shot at, at answering the question, what can we do better? Uh, you know, you've, you've celebrated our successes and thank you for those stories, but, but we're not complacent with what we've got now. We, we clearly need to do more and we need to do it better. So um, maybe I'll do it in reverse order. So I'll start this time with Anne. 
Um, I, would, I would recommend a few things. One, um, even if in your evaluation now, for, first of all, uh, for the faculty, even in your evaluation now, if you're looking at application, for example, relook at those rankings. Make sure that they really are encouraging interaction with um, you know, the, the communities beyond the scientific community and making sure that you're essentially deploying that science into the community in a usable way. The second thing that I would say in terms of your students is make sure that your students are being exposed to group interactions and group decision making and group products. Because sadly, you rarely do something on your own. And so the more that you can see how that group process works, even if there are weak people in the group and strong people in the group, those are really, really important leadership skills. The other that I would say is figure out the exercises that really make people have to distill the messages down and communicate them clearly without using jargon. Make sure that you can write so that your mother might, um, might understand, your next door neighbor might understand, uh, the plumber who's coming to fix your washing machine might understand. You know, and see how in each circumstances you would use slightly different words. It's not one memo for everyone. It's really you have to be willing to rewrite it, just like you'd rewrite your resume for different job applications. And I think those skills are really critical for every student coming out of the schools. Thanks, Anne. I, I think you're right about the uh, team science and the group science. And you said the weak and the strong ones can work together. Remember from Mike Roman, we only have above average students. So they're, they're all good. It's still a range. <laughs> uh, Yoda, I mean Stuart. Um, well, I, I wouldn't uh, presume to, to tell you what you should do or could do better. Um, I guess I, I would I'd ask a question, though. Um, one of the things I think UMSEES understands, uh, and Maryland understands, is that science plays a critical institutional role in a function, functioning democratic society. And that proposition is under threat, as Senator Pinsky has alluded to. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, is how, you know, what is, what is UMSI's responsibility to help step up to that threat, you know, above and beyond the way in which you train your scientists to engage in specific public policy conversations within the state of Maryland. Um, you know, that threat is not as severe in Maryland as it is in other places in the country, but I don't think that we should feel as if we are somehow um, going to be able to sort of island ourselves off from the consequences of that threat, particularly an institution like UMSEs that relies rather heavily on federal revenue. So I think there's, a, there's a, 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 a large strategic question about, you know, how, you know, how, how UMSEs responds to that. And, and some of that, um, I think, t for me, does connect to the question of how you're training your scientists in as much as it, it, it one of the, um, one of the vulnerabilities that I think science has in that contest um, is, is certain restrictive norms about engagement in public conversations. And so, you know, you, you are not, um, other, other disciplines are um, often f seem to feel less fettered in confronting and, um, threats. Than, than science does. So, so I, I, would, I, I would, would just suggest that that might be um, something worth thinking about. This is why they call him Yoda. He asks these deep, 
these penetrating, thought-provoking, self-reflective questions that make us really... If I, but if I were really Yoda, I wouldn't say anything, right? I yeah, would that's just, right. I'd just sit here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> ben, you can tell us how to shape so, up. So I have tried to answer a question from the chairman of the Environment Committee with a question, and it never works for me. <laughs> uh, but I would just, I, I don't have any great insights on how to improve UMSIs. Um, I, I would say, I liked Ann's comment about um, exposure to group decision making. Uh, I love science-based civility and, under, and appreciating where different people are coming from, and that's the key. It's not just the garnering your facts, but the way you become a, like Peter has and Don have and, and other UMSI's leaders have, is you, you know the facts, you have science behind it, but you're also listening to see what the policy objectives are so you can communicate and relate more effectively. And I think UMSIS does a pretty good job. I, I would say the big challenge, it's always a big opportunity, is to stay as engaged as you possibly can in some of those policy circles. So I know um, that the Scientific and Technical Working Group, as part of the Climate Change Commission for the state, is, is uh, increasingly important, and UMSIS leadership is going to be needed there. Uh, I know, and looking out in the audience and seeing other Chesapeake Bay cabinet members from agriculture and Maryland environmental science uh, in the room, I would say that uh, continued engagement in the governor's cabinet on climate uh, on, on uh, the Chesapeake Bay is going to be really important. And then the last point for UMSIs, which you demonstrate uh, is in the spirit of adaptive management, but also attentive to the policy needs that are coming up for the state of Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay region is to do what Wayne Gretzky always said, and that was the key to being a good hockey player, is not to just know where the puck is, it's to know where it's going. And so I think areas like water reuse and finding the right way to give proper credit for uh, e uh, ecosystem services and the use of um, solar-powered, automated aquaculture growing. Uh, a lot of these uh, important ideas, I know that UMSI's, the key to continuing to improve is to remain relevant and respectful and to be part of those policy discussions wearing the science hat. Great. Thanks. I like the idea of chasing that puck. Uh, Senator Pinsky. I want to go back to the tension, possibly a dialectic, that Stewart talked about between science and policy. I don't want to call it a contradiction, but it is a tension. And you know, policy development is not always done for the right reason. Um, there are some segments engaged in, in governing that develop policy based on pandering, unfortunately, playing to people's baser instincts. It's a, a, a type of right-wing populism, if you will. Um, and I use the example of the watermen, uh, uh, telling watermen that they can scrape the very last oyster off the bottom of the bay, even when we have sanctuaries, which would remove the oyster population and the filtering effort which the, which the oysters give to the bay, is just, you know, it is, it is, a, it is an affront to society. You know, telling a, a frustrated commuter that we'll take care of your frustration we'll add more lanes to Route 270 in Montgomery County or the Beltway or the Baltimore Washington Parkway and we're gonna solve your problem when we know putting tens or hundreds of thousands of cars on the road is gonna increase carbon dioxide and move us in the absolutely wrong direction on reducing greenhouse gas is again an affront to our society and the science that you work on every day of your life. You know, so what does that mean for, for UMSIs? What does it mean? Well, I think first, you have to be clear and unequivocal in the problems and the solutions. Clear and unequivocal. Now, unfortunately, if you have people who are pandering, it creates even a bigger gap between what the science says and what the politic, the body politic is saying. Um, and I think it's very important to ensure that you don't self-censor. If the gap is so wide, you say, my God, 
our solution is radically different from what's being said in, in the public, in the newspapers. You can't self-censor. If there is an obvious problem and science points to it and points to a clear solution, that's got to be voiced. And not only be voiced, it's got to be voiced effectively. Messaging is crucial. We saw what happened last week with the, with the fourth report being uh, put out to the public on Black Friday. Nuts. Okay, I mean, we have to do the opposite. We have to go an extra mile on getting the results of our science, uh, illuminating the problems and the solutions in front of the public, in radio and TV and press releases. We have to go out of our way to do a, a more effective job on that. At the end of the day, it means speaking truth to power. Because if the truth isn't out there, there's no way we can develop policy that's going to transform our, our environment, our, our society, our nation, our world. But that creates problems in and of itself. When you get out there with solutions that some will say um, don't follow from the science or are too radical, and these are politicians speaking, not other scientists, you know, are you putting yourself in jeopardy? Well, and, and this goes out to not just UMSIs, but to the supporters of UMSIs, the people ha that use their data. And I guess I would put the charge out to you that you've got to act as the shock troops and the rear guard to protect UMSIs. Because the more you go out there speaking truth to power, clear and unequivocally, you're going to take shots. Financial shots, political shots, you know, people who want to undercut your very foundation. And that means the supporters of UMSIs, or people who benefit from UMSIs, have to be those shock troops that protect it and ensure that it keeps its independence. Because if not, there will be some forces that want to cut it out, like a cancer, because they are telling the truth. Now, hopefully it won't get to that in Maryland, but we still have that dichotomy going on between policy and science. And, N not maybe as great as on the national level, but it is here. You know, there are, are proposals to add roads and roads and roads and not move to mass transit. There are, are efforts to tell the watermen, oh, don't worry about the science. You want to go into sanctuaries, go in. So we, we have to be bold and uh, we have to protect uh, UMSIs. Thank you. Wow. So I think uh, this panel has lived up to the promise of providing environmental intelligence. We've talked about oysters and crabs and climate and sea level. We talked about better communication. We talked about team science, talking truth to power, call to arms by Senator Pinsky to, to become shock troopers and a rear guard. Um, and, and we talked about being nimble and tenacious, being clear and unequivocal. It's, it's big and bold. So. With that, I'd like you to join me in thanking this environmentally intelligent uh, panel.